Okay, I want you to open your Bible with me in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want to speak today on the spirit of mammon. Spirit of mammon. This will be interesting for some of us, won't it? And while we're doing that, I'll just open my wallet and just take out some money. There we go. Look at that. And uh, I've got twenty dollars there, and another twenty dollars there. So why don't I just take this twenty dollars here? And uh, you see, already it'll be talking to you, because money talks. <laughs> money talks. It has a spirit behind us. We'll see shortly. And where's Anish? Anish, you somewhere there? Anish, I'd love to bless you. Here you go. Why don't you just have a cup of coffee with your wife? It's a great day for you to have a cup of coffee, isn't it? Eh? There you are. God bless you. I love you. You're a great guy. Praise the Lord. So I want to have a look at Matthew chapter 6. Jesus spoke a lot about uh, many things, but if you read through the Bible, you find it's quite interesting that the number of times he talked about wealth and possessions and stewardship and accountability far exceeded any discussion on any other topic. In fact, there's about 10, uh, 10 times the number of re references to finances and stewardship and resources than there are to faith and salvation. And yet all of these go together. And I want to share just a, a begin a new series. I want to talk about this area. <clears throat> Often the moment we start to talk about money, people freeze. And you'll see why just shortly. And uh, I'm not after anyone's money. I'm not trying to talk to anyone to give any money. I want to help us gain understanding of the spiritual nature of money and what lies behind it and how to be free, how to walk in freedom. And uh, so in uh, Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> it says, verse 20, 21, Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we ask the question, why did Jesus speak so much about stewardship, resources, being a steward, a servant of God, managing resources, finance? Why did he speak so much about that? There has to be something very important. And this verse tells us, why it's important. It says very clearly, where your treasure is, your heart is there too. Now, there's a lot of things we could teach on that, but let's just take the most simple thing is that where your wealth is, where the things you value lie, that's where your heart is. Wherever you, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Or put it simply, where your money and wealth is, that's where your heart will be. For example, if you bought one dollar worth of shares in a company, and the company falls over, you're not even worried at all. But if you put all your life savings in that company, now you'll be watching the paper every day to see how it's doing. In other words, where your treasure is, your heart will naturally flow there. And what Jesus makes it very, very clear. And God is concerned about our heart and what grips our heart. God does not need our money. He doesn't need the silver and the gold. Heaven's full of gold. Gold is like the paving stones of heaven. So therefore, in heaven, gold has a different perspective to what it has on the earth. God is interested in us. Gold and silver pass away, but people are eternal. And so God is interested in you, and he's interested in your blessing, your welfare, and your success in life. He, he wants us, each of us, to succeed in fulfilling our destiny in life. And so as we look at this area on the spirit of mammon, we'll see that there's a competition for your heart. And uh, so uh, I want to, uh, you can get a concordance out yourself and you'll find there are four references to mammon in the Bible and all of them are spoken by Jesus. And uh, one of them is found in Matthew chapter 6, so we'll read it up. Uh, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either you'll hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's the first reference to it. Second reference is found in Luke chapter 16. So have a look at Luke chapter 16 and then come back. In Luke chapter 16, <clears throat> in verse 9 through to verse 13, I say to you, make friends for yourselves of unrighteous mammon, so when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what which is least is faithful also in much, he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous manner, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. He will hate one and love the other, 
or be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And uh, this is the only time that Jesus ever said that you can't do this and that, that it's impossible. So what he's saying very clearly, he says it's impossible to serve mammon, whatever that means, and to serve God. There is an antagonism or they are opposed to one another. So we have to understand or look at what it means. And the first thing is, is to ask the question, what is the spirit of mammon? What is the spirit of mammon? The Bible is very clear that we live in a natural world, but there's also a spiritual world around us. And that the spiritual world influences and controls the lives of people. The Bible says in 1 John, it says that all of the world lies in darkness, or all of the world lies under the influence of spiritual powers. In Ephesians 6, it tells us also, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. There are our problems are not with the people around us. Our problems lie with wicked spirits who contend against us. We wrestle not with uh, uh, flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. So very clearly, the, the Bible over and over and over speaks of the invisible spirit realm. So we're going to ask the question, what is the spirit of mammon? The, the name or the word mammon literally means this. It means riches. Or it also means greed. It has a similar kind of meaning. It, it means something that you put your trust in, something you are leaning your life upon. And it comes uh, and, and dates way back. Uh, Jesus used the word uh, in Aramaic. Uh, he used the word mammon. It was translated to Greek. They never could come up with a word for it, so they just called it mammon in Greek. They called it mammon in Hebrew. They called it mammon in English. In other words, there's been no attempt to change the name. The name is the original name going right back to where it was originally used. And uh, where it originates from, of course, uh, it, it comes from the Syrian god of riches. And that originated out of the Tower of uh, Babel. Uh, you remember in the Old Testament how there was a group of people uh, wanted to find their own way to heaven, wanted to build themselves a tower, wanted to make their own way. They were full of pride and arrogance, and God came on them and confounded them. So the word Babel or, or Babylon means confusion. So this God of mammon or this uh, God of finances, God of wealth that they worshipped called mammon right through history, uh, that God dates right back to the Tower of Babel. It's rooted in confusion and pride and arrogance and independence. That's the roots of the thing. Interesting, it's just carried on. If you uh, were to watch or play some of the uh, modern uh, video games or DVD games, you'd be quite surprised how often mammon is one of the great gods that turns up in the video games that you have to contend against. In the game Dungeons and Dragons, mammon is uh, one, of, he's the arch devil of hell in one of the levels in the game. So this mammon everywhere through history has been portrayed or is a representative of a god. And we understand that things which are worshipped in the Old Testament have spirit powers behind them. So if you track through the Old Testament, you find God's people continually contended with idolatry. They are, the, the idol of Baal continually was a problem for them. Uh, Chemosh was another one, or Molech, where they worshipped and sacrificed their children. The spirit behind that still works today in the area of abortion. And so these ancient gods that Israel fought all had behind them a spiritual power, and that spiritual power is still present today. We read the Old Testament, we see the natural stories of worship of idols, but it was to try and teach us that behind the idols is a spiritual power. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes and he says, those that worship idols or fellowship with idols, fellowship with demons, and he says you can't fellowship with demons and with God. So consistently through history and right through to today, mammon refers to wealth, riches, but more particularly to greed. Greed is an uh, uh, inordinate desire. I need more. I'm not satisfied with what I have. I need more. So you ask the question, how much is enough? And the answer is always the same, a bit more. And it wouldn't matter how wealthy you are. You ask how much is enough? A bit more. A bit more. You could ask a poor person how much is enough, they need a bit more to get by. Ask a rich person how much is enough, they need a bit more. 
the same things. It doesn't matter what level of society you work at. And so behind this operates a spirit. Now you notice here in the key verse we're looking at in, Mark, in Matthew 6 verse 24, no man can serve two masters. He will hate one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So we need to have a look at what that is about. God is a spirit. We know that God is invisible, but he's a spirit being. We are made in his image. We are spirit beings. We're made for intimacy with God. We're made for relationship with God. We're made to love God, enjoy him, and then live a life that reflects him and serves him. That's what we're designed for. So anything that competes with the place of God in our heart is obviously going to have behind it some demonic spirit, some demonic power. So it says you can't serve God. God is a spirit and mammon. Mammon must be a spirit. He's contrasting one with the other. So mammon is a spirit being. Now, it's a very, very real spirit. It's a demonic spirit uh, associated again with wealth, riches, and assets or coveting more. In Colossians 3 and verse 5, it warns us about coveting. Coveting is I see what someone else has that I don't have and I want it. Coveting becomes idolatry when it starts to control our life. So very clearly, when we're looking at this issue of mammon, we're looking at a spirit which seeks to get hold of your life. Now, of course, we just love Jesus. We're here to worship God. It would never occur that perhaps we might be serving this God. I remember being in a Bible school and uh, teaching on the video games and how they open the door to the occult, uh, some of them uh, in the role-playing occultic games, and 200 students came up and they were committed to serving God, but actually in their private time they were bowing down to a demon. And we'll see that behind this thing always lies deception. So, so there it is. So, uh, let's, so here's the thing. The first thing to see then is that there are two spirits that long for our heart. God longs for your heart so he can bless you. Mammon longs for your heart so he can control you. And so we see that there's a conflict goes on between the two. It's not. first thing is to recognize that there is a conflict. Money itself has no power. See, this is just a piece of paper. Lovely piece of paper. $20 piece of paper. And it, but it actually has no value at all unless you can trade it for something. See, the value is what I put on it. And, of course, I could have hundreds and hundreds of these, and overnight they could lose their value. You watch what's happened to money over the last decade or so. It, it's lost its value. They've just printed more and more of them. They've just lost value, meaning by that you can't, it takes more to buy the same thing than what it did a while ago. We call it by a fancy name inflation. But the reality is just the piece of paper lost its value. It took more pieces of paper to buy the same thing. So the dollar lost its value. And uh, for many years now, as there's been the spirit of greed operating through the financial sectors, it has created huge problems globally in the financial area and has eroded the value of money. And behind it has been greed. Anyone who looked at the recent financial issues in America and in the world, you do understand that the problem is greed, not enough money. The issue is not the money. The issue is the greed and the spirit power that manipulates and controls people through the money. That is what the problem is. This is just a piece of paper. This piece of paper is neither good nor bad. It can be used to bless someone. It can be used for evil. What really determines it is the spirit that sits on it, the spirit that motivates how it's used. So all money has a spirit associated with it because money is a form of trading in the world. See, this money itself, <clears throat> originally they used to trade gold. So real wealth was gold. If you had gold, you had real wealth. And then it was inconvenient. They, con they made the gold into coins, and so people traded with gold coins. I've got a gold coin on this ring here. So that was a form of trade at one point. And then it became inconvenient, so then they made had paper money. So they made pieces of paper that originally, if you're old enough in my generation, you could redeem this for a pound of gold. Do you remember that? Then they took away the pound of gold and just made more pieces of paper, and the money lost all its value. So this is money. So the thing then is that money is just a way of trading. 
And the world system is one of trading. I give you something wanting something back. I trade. So I might trade my money in order to receive something back. But the world system is a system of trading, of buying and selling. The kingdom of God is different to that. It runs on a different principle. But the problem is we're so used to buying and selling and trading that when we come to God, we start to think the same way about God. Well, if I just give him my offering, he will bless me. That's the principle of the world, trading, buying and selling. It stops you coming into any kind of area of blessing because it depends on your works. Well, if I just tithe, God has to bless me. Well, people think that, but actually that's not true. God blesses because he's a giver, he's generous, and he loves to bless. And when you align your finances with his plan, then, of course, blessing starts to increase and flow because you've actually bought it out of the power of mammon. So it helps us if we understand that money or, or finances or wealth or riches have a spirit behind it that seeks to use it. Now, we've got to understand that I can have God on my money and live in blessing in my money, a river of blessing in my finances, or I can have the spirit of mammon resting on it and I will have many, many problems. So the issue of, of money or wealth or riches is really an issue of what controls your heart person who has got a great heart with God will be entrusted with a flow of resources to work through their life. Their money is good. It's got the blessing of God on it. A person who's under the control of mammon will live with other problems on their life. We need to try and identify what they are. Okay then, so we see then that there is a spirit world. There's a spirit called the spirit of mammon uh, which competes uh, for your heart, your attention, uh, your relationship with God. Now you notice there it says no one can serve two masters. So how does mammon operate? How does that spirit operate? Is there any way I would know that mammon has got a hold of my life? How could I know whether I'm under the influence of that spirit or not? My assumption is I'm not. But the problem is that's the whole point of deception. You think you're one thing and then it's something else. So we want to have a look at that. So uh, the first thing to realize is mammon's intention is to control your heart, your love, and your loyalty. Notice what it says here. No one can serve two masters. He'll hate one and love the other. He'll be loyal to one and despise the other. So here's the thing. Mammon desires, it's a spirit, see? So behind this is a spirit. Here's the bait and here's the spirit. And the spirit wants to use the bait to gain control over your life. And so how does it do it? Well, what it's trying to do, its intention is to have you love and serve and be loyal to it. And that's always the way of idolatry. They wanted people to bow to them, to love them, to serve them. But all idolatry ended up in bondage, fear, uh, terrible problems. So mammon is opposed to God. Very clear in that scripture, you can't serve two ma masters. So mammon is an antichrist spirit. It is an anti-Christ spirit. It's opposed to what God wants to do in your life. And the Bible is very clear that in the last days, it will so control the world's financial system that anyone who will not participate in that will actually be marked out, won't be able to trade. So it's a spirit. Secondly, it is looking for slaves or servants. So mammon is a spirit that seeks to control your life. I don't think there's any neutrality in it. It's pushing on you all the time. It's talking on you all the time. So mammon is a spirit that seeks. It's looking for a slave. And here's the third thing. Mammon is looking to take the place of God in your life. Okay? So it's looking for slaves. It's looking to take God's place in your life. If it can seed in taking God's place in your heart, you will find yourself serving mammon, not God, holding mammon, not the Lord, despising the Lord, when it comes to the area of God's provision for your finances and for your prosperity. So, how does it operate? It operates by deception. Now, you've got to remember this, a spirit talks to you. So, money talks to you. I'm using this and holding up because some will be thinking, what am I going to do with it? And I've already given one away, I want to give the other one to me. And it's because, don't tell me you're not thinking that. And see, this is why I'm holding up, wavering, because it'll talk to you. What will I do with it? 
See, it's, it, and that's the thing. You see, money talks. You know what it usually says? There's not enough. It says, you can't do that because there won't be enough for you. So one of the things the spirit of mammon does when it talks to you, it reminds you you don't have enough. Why? Because it wants you to know you need a bit more. But how much is a bit more? It'll be all your life, it'll need a bit more. End of the week, every week for all my life, I've needed a bit more, it would seem. And so you need a bit more. So it talks you need a bit more. You can't give. If you give, there won't be enough. So it always talks and always saying to you, there's not enough. Here's the second thing that Mammon says. It says this often when you're in the shop. You need this. You need this. I need this. I need that. I think I looked on the, the flash uh, on a Commodore car owned by someone in our church and had, I need this, was on the back. I looked at it and I thought, I do need this. This is a really nice car. <laughs> Very soon my mind was agreeing with what the Spirit was saying. I need this. Lovely V8 with head, hopped up motor. I did need it too, you know. No, not really. It's just a spirit that talks. It talks. They talk, they talk all the time. Here's another way it'll talk to you. This talks to Christians. If I had a bit more money, I'd really be able to give to poor people and help them. If I had a bit more. So when I've got a bit more, I'll really be able to do a lot to help people when I've got a bit more. See, now remember that the whole thing behind greed is you always need a bit more. So that's, the, that's what the Spirit, so it talks. And so, and so what it does is it promises, it promises you something. So here's mammon, here it is here. So it's talking to you and it's making promises. If you had enough, you'd be really free. If only I had enough, I'd be free. I need a bit more. It's true, isn't it? See, if I, if I had enough, if I had, if I had more money, I'd be independent. I'd be able to really do some things then. I wouldn't have to go to that workplace. If I just won the lottery, man, there's all these things I could do if I won the lottery. I don't want to read about all the stories of people who, who won it and their lives become ruins. I don't want to read that at all. I just want to think constantly, if I had a bit more, I'd be really right. So it always is talking, and it makes promises. It promises you'll have freedom, financial freedom. You'll have security. Everything will be right. Remember, Jesus talked about a man who had everything, all the money, and he said, I'm now I'm right. And the guy said, well, what are you going to do tonight? Your soul's required of you. Now what? Who are you going to leave it all to? So money talks all the time. Talks things not enough. It speaks to you. It continually tries to dominate your thinking. And if you will agree with what it's saying, you'll end up following its leading. Isn't that true? <laughs> See? And here's the other thing, too, you'll notice, is that people are more valuable if they've got more money. So automatically we rank people, the ones who've got the wealth, the ones who've got no wealth. The Bible says very clearly when people come into the church, treat them all the same. It doesn't matter if they're wealthy. Wealthy people, ordinary people, they're all people, and they ought to be treated of, of same value. But even in our society, people automatically, the one who's got more is more valuable. To me, he's got more worries and more problems. You know, but people think he's more valuable. So, we, so here's the thing is people think and believe that money has power, but money has no power. Demons have power. Money doesn't have power. Money is just a piece of paper. It's the demon, the spirit that controls the thing that has the power. Like God has power. He says, I give you in Deuteronomy power to get wealth. So God has power. Demons have power. Money doesn't have power. But if you believe it's got power, then you're going to seek it. And you'll find yourself in a conflict because it will seek your heart. It'll seek your loyalty. It'll seek your service. And you'll find as you yield to it, then it starts to affect you. People don't realize that as we give in to the voice of money, the voice of the spirit of mammon, we can find ourselves loving mammon and hating God. You say, how could that be? I, I can be holding on to mammon and despising or in other words, thinking little of God's ways of doing life and managing money. And I can be loyal to money and disloyal to God. But it's actually not the money. It's not this. It's the spirit. That's the thing that gets you. It's the spirit. So would there be any evidences in your life if the spirit had hold of you? There'd be heaps of them. 
Because straight away Jesus said, uh, verse 25, don't be anxious. So one of the first things that happens around money is extreme anxiety and worry. If you are having extreme anxiety and worry around finances, you are under the influence of a spirit. God has got no anxiety and worries to give you. He's got peace. He tells you what to do about anxiety and worry. Redirect your attention in certain ways. Uh, here's another one. My, I, I would think that one of the, the biggest evidences to me that a person's under the spirit of bondage uh, to mammon is very simply this. They just can't give. It just is impossible. See, if I have some money in my hand here, here's the big question to ask. Do I have the money... Or does the money have me? Who's holding who? You see, if I'm holding the money, it's very simple. I'm able to then open it and let go of it and give it to someone, which I did before. If the money's holding me, I think, oh, it won't be enough. I need a bit more. Can you understand? One of the, the greatest ways that you can tell if money's got a hold of you is the ability to give. And we're going to see, as we get into one or the other, I want to speak on another session and talk about the whole issue of generosity and also what you do that brings the blessing of God around your money. So uh, anxiety and fear and ability to give a poverty mentality is not enough. If you continually live with this thinking dominating you that I haven't got enough, I haven't got enough, I haven't got enough, you are under bondage to a spirit. Absolutely. Uh, another evidence would be impulse buying. If you find you just can't stop buying, you are under the influence of that spirit. It's just, it's got control over you. You're buying more than you could spend more than you've got money. If you're in bondage to debt so that you're paying so much back in interest, you've got no ability to do anything for God, this is a spirit. You're in bondage to a spirit. We need to find a way out of that. Uh, if you continually find that you're discontented with what you have and ungrateful for what you have, I'm sorry, you're under a spirit. Because Paul says, in every state I find myself in, whether it's abundance or lack, I've learned to be content, grateful to God. So there are some very tangible evidences if this thing is impacting our life. Uh, I remember, uh, in, and I don't even know how much God's got to show me, but I do remember a particular season when God showed me clearly the extent to which I was in bondage to the Spirit. And looking back now, I'm very ashamed of it, but it was a horrendous bondage. I was brought up, of course, in an environment where security was everything. So my father come back having been through the depression, through the war, and coming back having to rebuild. So being having security, a secure job, secure income, it was everything. So I was working for the government, had a government superannuation, and God spoke to me, I want you to let it all go, and I want you to go into ministry and set up a Christian school. Now, I heard his voice, responded to his voice, but the, the fear that overtook my life, I can hardly describe it. It was just horrendous fear. I remember when I made the decision, put in my resignation, I made the decision to let go and do what God wanted me to do. I was in tears, uncontrollable tears, for almost three days with fear of what was going to happen to me and my family. The, the, the spirit had such a grip around me. I, I remember just weeping and going through this, this dread that I'd done something terrible to my family and to our future. I, I had fears about how I'd provide, because the job that I picked up in ministry, uh, my wage went down by 75%. I just got one quarter of what I've been getting. And, and we had very little to go, to, to go on. But, so what happened was this overwhelming fear uh, that I'd not have enough and that I wouldn't be able to provide for my family's education, their clothing, and when it came later on to weddings, I wouldn't be able to provide for weddings. It, it just come around me. And along with it, tremendous shame at not having much. And it wasn't helped by Christians. You know, they actually were incredibly unkind. And some of the worst difficulties I had were with Christians because God was teaching me to break free of the control of money and learn how to lean on him and depend on him. But I had to make a change in lifestyle and in heart attitude. I had to learn to let go of all of the things we had and learn to be grateful for the little things we had. And so we couldn't buy meat. We would go and buy with some other guys six sheep and we'd kill them all and do them all and, and then we would have meat. And the rest of the time, we didn't have meat. But I was thankful we could do that. Uh, 
we would come up here and I'd bring a trailer up and we'd go around into the orchards and we'd pick up apples off the ground and put them into boxes and take them back and store them right through winter. We had apples all winter. There are many things that Joy did over the years because we just didn't have the income. But what God was dealing with was the fear of not having enough and teaching us he can and does provide and he is to be trusted. Now, the first time I ever had money for a wedding was when the first wedding came. But prior to that, never had I any excess in my account. Always I was on the edge all the way. But God made a way, and we never lacked. We had holidays. I didn't have a car for a while. We just drove around on bikes. But we learned, the biggest thing I learned was to be content, to trust God, and to become generous with what we did have. So it affected the way we bought a house, the way we did everything. Everything was affected by learning to break out of the spirit of mammon and the dread and anxiety and fear it would bring around every aspect of life and provision. And if we didn't have much, we didn't have much. We thank God and we celebrated with what we had. So we'll share with you some of the keys around that. But the big thing is the spirit that was behind it. And to break free of that spirit was just a, it was a, as a major, it was the major first step for me to get into ministry. The biggest obstacle of all was the spirit of mammon. What will happen? How about that? How about that? <laughs> and we've had to learn to develop a generous lifestyle. So, this, you know, the fear of provision and the embarrassment. I remember uh, one of the first times I went to my friends in Wellington. We had a reunion after being in university. And, uh, of course, they're all uh, highly skilled professionals. We all came out of the same physics class. Uh, we'd all done graduate. We'd gr we were all graduates and with honors or masters or doctorates. We come to meet them for the first time. And they've all got everything that money can buy. And we just had a little humble car. We, had, we were struggling. And you could tell from the way they looked just the, the despising of where we were at. And it took me a bit to get over the shame to actually say, no, God, I thank you. I've got six wonderful children. I have a wonderful wife. And we are serving you. And I'm content with that. I had to overcome the feelings later on in life uh, we've realized that what all glitters isn't gold. In fact, actually, they were all in bondage and they've all had problems of every kind ever since, not the least being marriages breaking up and children that went off the rail. So I've learned to be content. So it's a, it's a spirit. There is a spirit behind it. Now, does that mean that money is evil? Not at all. Let's have a look. We'll finish with this verse, 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. Some of you may understand that, that terrible dread and fear. You may know what that's like, you know, and you, you know when the next bill comes, how are you going to pay it, and the sickening when they open them up, and there's all the unexpected expenses come, all the, the fear of living like that. And uh, however, here it is. Let's have a look. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, verse 9. Those who desire to, uh, verse 8, uh, having food and clothing, let's be content with these. So contentment is a huge thing. Uh, those who desire to be rich or have greed fall into temptation and a snare, many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destructive perdition. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Notice this, the love of money, not money itself. Money not evil. Money is just a form of exchange. You can either have God on it or something else on it. Uh, but it's, it's the love of it. It's that greed, that desire, that longing for it that in the end gets a hold of your life. And it says the love of money is the love of a substitute for God. So when you love or you have a substitute for God, that is the root of all many problems. And we don't realize just how much that gets a hold of us. The love of money is a root. See? So if there's a love of money, it means you have a fear of being without it, and it controls all the decisions you make. In other words, a decision comes up, I can't afford to do that. We made a decision, we'd never tell our kids we were poor, even though we felt it at times. We never say we didn't have enough, we just find a way to do the best with what we had. So the love of money is a root that controls people. So money has no power, remember. It's the spirit behind you that makes you afraid by telling you you may not have enough. That's the spirit. It's a spirit that creates fear, anxiety, dread, lust, and greed in the heart. So money has no power. Notice it's, it's the love of it that creates it. And it says those, some have strayed from the faith in greed and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he's saying that some Christians having started well, when God comes on their life and they begin to prosper and get blessed, have a greed for more 
and in the end lose that, go off the rails. They lose it. In other words, or put it in a different language, when they were in need, they prayed and sought God. When they were prosperous, they didn't need him, and other things took over. So let's, I'll just finish with one last verse here in uh, Luke chapter 16, and uh, Jesus' teaching. Verse 9, I say, make to yourself friends of the unrighteous mammon, so when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He was faithful in what is least, is faithful in much, unjust in least, unjust in much, if you're not faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now notice what Jesus said, make friends with unrighteous mammon. Now that doesn't mean to say use your money to buy people. It's not saying that at all. Because the key word here is when you fail or when you die, they may welcome you. So what it's saying is mammon or money or riches, God says use your wealth to win people for Christ because he says when you die and you come into heaven you will have people come to greet you who will say thank you that you sacrificed and I was saved because the gospel went out and they will be they will greet you with gratitude with tears of thankfulness and appreciation that you used money you had to win people into the kingdom of God. This is why over the years as a church, we have had such an emphasis on missions, global missions. This is why we've poured money into Cambodia and Uganda and Philippines and, and more recently, of course, into, uh, into in Pakistan, into the television station. And it may seem at times like it's just another project, you've got to give money, but understand we're taking money to win friends for eternity. And maybe... We go through lack and it's not enough quite at the moment. But what you've got to remember is there will be a day where you'll enter heaven. And on that day, for us as a church, there are going to be heaps of people who will say, thank you, Bay City. You were so generous. I'm amazed that, that for this ministry that Anwar has, so few churches are involved with it. I'm staggered that we are involved with it. I can't understand how something with global reaching potential we're, we're probably the only church that stood up and said, we're going to go with you and make this happen. We raised the money for the satellite TV. We've had missionaries go over. We've poured money in. And, and uh, of all the money that's been received in New Zealand, about a half of it came from Bay City. It, it's just extraordinary. So uh, I want to thank you and honor you because this is, what, this is what's called is making friends out of unrighteous mammon. This is about using wealth to, uh, to bring in the nations of the world. When you fail, uh, I need to close in now. So, so how can we break free of the spirit of mammon? I think the first thing is to recognize the signs that you're in bondage. And there can be many reasons. There can be acute lack when you're younger. There can be going through hardship and you make inner resolves. I'll never, never lack or I'll never have my family. You can do all this kind of stuff out of bitterness, hurts, pains, and failures or out of just straight being under the influence of the Spirit, we come into bondage. The first thing to do is just recognize I'm in that place of bondage. Second thing is to come to the Lord and repent. This is a spirit. It's not about the money. It's the spirit that gets a grip of your heart so you can't access God's blessing and fruitfulness on your lives as he wants you to. And, and I know there'll be some people here, and around the issue of money, there's immense bitterness, immense grief and pain all kinds of injustices you've faced and difficulties and hardships, but you don't have to be in bondage to that spirit. You can instead let God heal your heart, bring it to a place of enlargement. Number one step is to acknowledge where I'm at. Number two, I need to come to the Lord with a repentant heart. Say, God, I'm sorry I put my trust in these things. And the third thing is I need to honor God. And we won't go into that today, but I need to actually make a decision that with my finances, I will give God a place of honor. We'll talk about that in another session. How can I honor God with my fun? I've got to honor God with them to bring his blessing over them because otherwise there's another spirit that says not enough. And finally, I need to learn how to be a good steward of what God has given me. So that's another aspect of it again. So I need to recognize there's a problem. I need to come to the one who can help in repentance and faith expecting him to help. I need to make some changes so I start to honor God with my giving with the first of everything I have, and then finally I need to become a great steward of what God has given me 
So I actually then use well what God has given me, and that involves a whole range of things in our life. Let's just close our eyes right now. Father, I just thank you for your presence here today, helping us to deal with that thing, to deal with this issue of money. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I sense, you know, as even as I talk, people get a bit tense and uncomfortable, but I'm trying to help us to just, I'm trying to uncover a spirit that makes your life miserable, that brings you into bondage and sabotages your relationship with God. Remember, no one can serve two masters. We love one and hate the other. We serve one, despise the other, loyal to one and disloyal to the other. It really does show up in can I honor God with my finances? Am I managing them well? And do I have a spirit of generosity around me? Holy Ghost, I just ask that any person here today that's in the grip of this spirit, that you would deeply convict them and help them today. And that, Lord, as a church, we begin to journey into a place of great increase and great blessing financially, great increase in our lives, great increase in our finance, great increase in our resources. Father, a total breaking over our lives of of meanness and tightness and stinginess and, and, uh, and of every kind of bitterness and, and anger and frustration around money. Lord, I ask that you would unlock the hearts of every person here, the finances of every person. May every family here be blessed, every business be blessed, every person here be blessed in abundance and finances. Just while our eyes are closed, I wonder if God spoke to you today and you realize to your shame or embarrassment or fear or concern that actually the Spirit has got a hook into my life. I'd love you just to acknowledge it today. Just put your hand up and say, God, I know you're speaking to me today. Would you do that just right now? God bless, God bless, God bless. Many hands going up. I'm glad you're so honest. I'm glad you're so honest. We can't solve it all today, but we will pray for you and believe God for a breakthrough in that thing. For some of you, there'll be some issues in your past you'll have to address. But always, it's fear and your belief that this thing is what I need to make my life safe. I wonder if there's anyone else here today and you, you're not yet a Christian, but you'd love to receive Jesus today, invite Jesus to become your Savior, to make a public a, a declaration that I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus said to everyone who received him, he gave power to become a child of God. Everyone who believed on his name, trusted in him. So today, is there any person here, right at that place where you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'd love you just to raise your hand. Let me know right now. Is there any person here, just right at that place, wanting to receive Jesus? Father, I just thank you for each person that's responded here today. Father, I pray for the power of your Spirit to come over their lives to bring release in the mighty name of Jesus as we move forward into blessing, enlargement, increase, and growth in every aspect of our life, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just stand, give a lot of clap. We'll finish with a song. Those who would like prayer or ministry, please make your way to the front. We want to pray with you, stand with you, and help you. Anyone who'd like prayer, especially around this area, someone to stand with you in agreement, let's just come. You may have suffered in this area may be struggling in this area, may have tremendous grief or fear, we'd love to pray with you. Would you like to come? Just right now.